Our story begins in the central region of the province of Ontario, in what has been called the Playground of Canada. The District of Muskoka. A land of hills and rocks and trees and lakes, set amid the rugged grandeur of the Canadian Shield. These lakes, once the home of the Indian, the fur trader, the logger, and the settler, are now the summer haven for thousands of tourists and cottagers every year. Some families have been coming to this region from the cities of central Canada and the United States for three or four generations. There are three important towns in the Muskoka district. Huntsville, the focal point for North Muskoka. Bracebridge, the district seat. And Gravenhurst, gateway to the Muskoka Lakes. A pleasant little community of about 4,000 people, Gravenhurst combines good shopping and fine scenic attractions with excellent links to Toronto and the cities of the south by road and rail. Muskoka Bay, the harbor of Gravenhurst, is now the home of the outboard motorboat, the inboard and the sailboat. It is also the home of a very different type of vessel, the Royal Mail steamship Seaguen, a resident passenger ship since 1887. The Seaguen is now unique. Named from an Ojibwe word meaning springtime, she is now the oldest steamship in North America and also the only ship of her kind still afloat and operating in Canada. She is one of the few remaining iron-hulled ships in the world and the last survivor of what was once the largest fleet of Royal Mail steamships in the world. Today, the Seaguen is alone on the Muskoka Lakes. Once, she was just one of several fine steamers that were the pride of the North. The fleet of the Muskoka Lakes Navigation Company, which served the district faithfully for 92 years. In 1949, when this film was taken, the company had five steamers in service. At one time, it had ten. The fleet began modestly with one small paddle wheel steamer in 1866. And from that beginning, it grew steadily into the largest line of its kind in Canada. For three quarters of a century, the lake steamers were the economic lifeline of the Muskoka district. To understand what the steamers meant to this region once, we must look back through the mists of time. To the mid-19th century, when the Muskoka district was no more than a vast Indian hunting ground, visited occasionally by a few trappers and fur traders. It might have remained so indefinitely, except that by 1850, the good farming lands of southern Ontario had already been taken up. Since the CPR had not yet been built and the prairies were still out of reach, the only lands still available at the time were the forested hills of the north within the Canadian Shield. Consequently, the Canadian government, unaware of the true nature of the Shield country, decided to open up the northern lands by building new colonization roads and offering free lands to settlers. It proved, in the main, a tragic mistake. Just to get to Muskoka, one had to take a train from Toronto to Barrie, then board a steamboat on Lake Simcoe for Orillia. catch another small steamer on Lake Kuchiching for Washego, and try to find a wagon team to proceed up the Muskoka Road, which started at Washego and meandered north to Gravenhurst, Bracebridge, 
and eventually Huntsville and Lake Nipissing. The early roads usually left a lot to be desired, so much so that it often took four hours to move a loaded wagon 15 miles. Once they arrived, the new settlers had to cope with hardship, isolation, loneliness, mosquitoes, black flies, forest fires, and bitterly cold winters, sometimes falling to 40 below. Worse still, though a few were lucky enough to find arable soil on their lots, for most it was a different story, and today the district abounds with abandoned lots and clearings, silently reverting to the bush and bearing mute testimony to broken dreams. Organized transport facilities initially did not exist, and sometimes settlers had to walk 40 or 50 miles as far as Aurelia or even Barry, just to mail a letter or collect a barrel of flour to feed their families. No wonder many of them soon became discouraged and left. Matters were improved immensely during the fall of 1865 when Mr. A.P. Coburn, a venturesome merchant from Victoria County, paid a visit to Muskoka and immediately grasped its potential. By the spring of 1866, Mr. Coburn built a large new store in the tiny hamlet of Gravenhurst and founded a stage service south to the steamboat landing at Washago. He also constructed an 80-foot paddle wheel steamboat near this site on Muskoka Bay to fly on Lake Muskoka. The lumber used in the boat all had to be whips on since there were still no sawmills in the area. She was called the Winona, meaning firstborn. She was a small, flat-bottomed wood burner capable of speeds of about 10 miles an hour. She was not a very elegant craft, but she was a godsend to the struggling settlers for whom she transported freight, passengers, and mail for 20 years to all parts of Lake Muskoka. Cement, lumber, groceries, and cattle might all be part of a day's haul. She also towed logs and scows and occasionally ran excursion cruises. At first, the vessel often ran aground and failed to make money. But by 1868, business improved, and she was soon joined by other steamers, such as the little Wabamick, the graceful Nipissing, and the sturdy little Simcoe. Meanwhile, the government lent a hand by building a lock on the Indian River at the rising village of Port Carling in 1871. At the same time, a short canal was opened at the neighboring village of Port Sandfield. These two improvements allowed the steamers to extend their routes further north into Lake Russo, as far as Russo Village, and to Lake Joseph, up to the new terminus at Port Coburn, a total distance of 45 miles right through the heart of the district. As roads and settlements continued to advance, Steamboats also began to ply on the North Muskoka Lakes, from Port Sydney on Mary Lake to Huntsville and beyond, starting in 1877. And on the Lake of Bays, from Baysville to Dwight and Dorset, starting in 1878. Meanwhile, the Muskoka district got another big boost. 
the Northern Railway of Canada was starting to follow settlers and lumbermen north. From Barrie on Lake Simcoe, the line was gradually being extended up the lake on to Orillia in 1872. Thence up to Lake Kuchiching and north to Rochego in 1873. Slowly, the rails crept northwards. At last, the line reached Gravenhurst, where it finally terminated at Muskoka Wharf Station on Muskoka Bay by the winter of 1875. Muskoka Wharf at once became the new trans-shipping depot from the trains to the lake steamers. For the next 77 years, tons of freight and thousands of passengers were transferred from trains to steamers and back again. And in time, new steamers were built to cope with the rush, including the Russo, a large passenger tug. The sturdy Muskoka, a powerful all-purpose steamer. The speedy Canoza, meaning pickerel. And the ornate little Oriole. By now, Mr. Coburn's line had blossomed into the Muskoka Navigation Company, the most successful inland boat line in all of Canada. Then, a setback occurred. In August 1886, the line lost its flagship, the Nipissing, which was destroyed by fire while docked overnight at Port Coburn on Lake Joseph. to be replaced by a new Nipissing, which was built at the Clyde shipyards in Scotland in 1887. Immediately after the railway reached the Muskoka Lakes, in marched the lumber trade, catering to the almost insatiable demand of the British market for square timber and the American demand for sawn lumber the lumber companies lost little time invading the Muskoka pineries, building mills and setting up bush camps. Now that the region was within easy access of Toronto, soon hundreds of settlers began working part-time for the lumber companies for a little extra cash. Within just a few years, a total of 17 sawmills and shingle mills were built at Gravenhurst, which soon became known as the Sawdust City. Over 50 million board feet of sawn lumber left Gravenhurst in 1883 alone, more than any other town in Ontario next to Ottawa.
Until the turn of the century, the timber trade was king in Muskoka. All this provided important new work for the lake steamers. Nearly 35 steam tugs and scow boats were built after 1875 to tow booms of logs to the sawmills and scow loads of supplies and provisions up the lakes to the lumber camps. Some of these vessels included squat, ungainly towboats known as alligators or warping tugs, like this specimen preserved in Algonquin Park. Alligators were so called because they were amphibious and could actually winch themselves ashore from one lake to another. And they did their towing by winching their toes along with a cable and anchoring themselves to the bottom of the lakes. For decades, the alligator was a familiar sight in Muskoka. When tanneries were built at Bracebridge and Huntsville, steamers were also used to haul in scow loads of tan bark to the plants. But the logs were often a mess to navigation. And sometimes a passenger ship had to run the risk of breaking a propeller while trying to force its way through the logs. Though lumbering was big business in Muskoka until the 1920s, there was still room for tourists as well. Small parties of campers and sportsmen began visiting Muskoka as early as 1860 to hunt and fish and generally get back to nature. Ten years later, in 1870, the district's first summer resort hotel was built at this site, where Russo Village now stands. Owned by an eccentric American gentleman named William Pratt, the hotel was officially called the Russo House, but was usually known as Pratt's Hotel. The first wilderness resort to be built anywhere in Canada, the Russo House commanded a lovely view from its lofty hilltop overlooking Lake Russo. Though it stood for just 13 years, Pratt's Hotel established a whole new trend in summer vacationing and became the forerunner of dozens of fine hotels built later in the district. In 1872, a second hotel, the Summit House, was built at this site, at the Steamboat Wharf at Port Coburn, at the head of Lake Joseph. For many years, these two resorts were the only ones on the Muskoka Lakes. However, by the 1880s and 90s, as more and more tourists began discovering Muskoka, a rush of new resorts followed. At such places as Bomaris, on Lake Muskoka. Windermere, on Lake Russo. Cleveland's House, at Minette, on Western Lake Russo. Prospect House, at Port Sandfield. Elgin House, on Lake Joseph. And many others as well. Naturally, all the resorts became calling places for the lake steamers. In 1902, the Muskoka Lakes Navigation Company built its own giant resort hotel, the Royal Muskoka Hotel on Lake Russo once the largest summer hotel in all of Canada. The Royal Muskoka was a magnificent place with its own golf course and capable of taking 350 guests. Following the new resorts came private summer cottages and boathouses. 
many of them reflecting the wealth of their owners. With them came the ultimate prestige item, the private steam yacht, some of which were up to 70 feet in length. Most had a uniformed captain and engineer to run them. Besides the yachts, there were dozens of small steam launches as well. As more and more tourists kept flocking to Muskoka every summer, the Muskoka Navigation Company had to build more and more steamers to cope with the crowds. In 1893, the elegant big steamer Medora was launched at Gravenhurst, to be followed by the Onik, a small auxiliary steamer, and the handsome little Islander, long a favorite on the Muskoka lakes. Still, business grew, and in 1906 and 1907, two majestic new steel-hulled palace steamers were built. The Sagamo, or Big Chief, and her smaller running mate, the Cherokee. The proud fleet now numbered 10 steamships, collectively capable of taking about 2,400 passengers at a time. The Grand Trunk Railway, which had absorbed the old Northern Railway, now had to send up to five express trains a day from Toronto to Gravenhurst to cope with the rush. As we can see from this actual old news film taken at Muskoka Wharf in 1903. By now, the resort and steamship eras were at their height, with not a cloud in the sky, except... <gasps> what kind of a contraption is that? Some steamers were even fitted out to take food and provisions around the lakes to sell to cottagers and campers. Though a few of these supply boats were run by local farmers, most were operated by merchants from the towns. From Bala came the city of Bala. From Milford Bay, the Alporto. From Russo, the Constance. And from Port Carling, the Mink and the New Minko. There were others as well. The boats would stock up every morning to begin their rounds. Touring the lakes, and calling on their customers. For many a year, the supply steamer was always a welcome sight. Despite the disruptions of the war years, the Muskoka steamers carried on. Music 
after the war, things seem to return to normal. The lordly Sagamo continued to ply north from Gravenhurst every day. Connecting with her sister ships at Beaumaris and Port Carling. In 1925, the steamer Seguin, rebuilt from the old steamer Nipissing, was added to the fleet. And in 1927, the navigation company acquired its last steamer, the Waomi, meaning water lily, to ply mostly on Lake Joseph. It was much the same on the North Muskoka Lakes, where new resorts were sprouting, and Captain George Marsh was consolidating the Huntsville and Lake of Bay's Navigation Company. Here, in 1930, the Muskoka Express arrives in Huntsville Station to connect with the steamer's Algonquin and Ramona of the Huntsville Navigation Company. Now entering Ferry Lake. And on to Deerhurst Inn before proceeding to the portage. Here, a tiny railway shuttles back and forth across the one-mile divide between Peninsula Lake and the Lake of Bays, where the steamers Iroquois and Mohawk Bell await us. All aboard the good ship Iroquois for the finest resort of all, fabulous Big Win Inn. Founded in 1920, Big Win Inn was the largest of all the Muskoka resorts. 
and could take up to 700 guests. Some visitors opt to take the ferry to Big Wind. There was nothing quite like Big Wind Inn. And here's the man who built it, Mr. C. O. Shaw, president of the Huntsville Navigation Company. During the 1920s, the Muskoka Navigation Company inaugurated one of North America's foremost tourist attractions, the 100-mile cruise. The main cruise from Gravenhurst was conducted by the flagship Sagamo, the Big Chief. The Medora, or the Cherokee, usually sailed from the port of Rosso. Well, the Seguin usually conducted the cruise from Bracebridge. Trains on the CPR ran daily from Toronto to the wharf station at Bala. There to connect with the little steamer Islander. Well, the Amex sailed from Torrance. Meanwhile, the Wyoming met the CN trains at Barnsdale or Lake Joseph Station. Every ship had its own routes and schedules. By train and car they came, bound for Muskoka. Let us join the throngs of happy people flocking to Muskoka Wharf for a cruise on the Sagamo. <laughs> it's all aboard now. as we leave Muskoka Wharf. And proceed up Muskoka Bay. Past the old Gravenhurst Sanatorium, or TB Hospital. To the Narrows, the channel leading to the main portion of Lake Muskoka. with its Guardian Lighthouse, built in 1905. On we go, north on Lake Muskoka, to our first stop, Glen Echo Lodge on Taylor Island. Then, on to Walker's Point. past the palatial summer residences of Millionaire's Row.
to the village of Beaumaris, where we meet the Seguin. for the usual exchange of passengers. <laughs> and here comes the islander, in from Bala. Farewell now. On we go to call it Milford Manor, then on to the Seven Sisters Islands. And Port Kuwaitan. Now passing One Tree Island. And approaching the Indian River. A lovely three mile stream. Now entering Foreman's Narrows. And coming up to Port Carling, the hub of the lakes. Here's the Cherokee waiting her turn to lock through. There's the Amik from Lake Joseph. The Sakamo locks through now. As we leave Port Carling and continue up the river and out onto Lake Russo,
setting our course for Windermere, one of the loveliest resort villages in Muskoka. Northbound again to Igwasan Lodge on Tobin Island for another stop. Now, passing Ross Trevor Lodge. And the Royal Muskoka Hotel, the largest on the lakes. Westbound now, that's the little church of St. John the Baptist at Marinas. And the Queen Victoria Rock, where you can see the profile of the Queen herself. Passing Painton House. And over to Cleveland's house, one of Muskoka's most popular resorts. Farewell now to Cleveland's as we continue southbound to Woodington House, one of the oldest on Lake Rosso. And onward to the charming village of Port Sandfield. We have now reached the gateway to Lake Joseph, which beckons ahead of us.
There's Pineland's Lodge with its lovely beach. The stately Elgin House. and the Glen Home Hotel. And beautiful Sherwood Inn. Bound still until we arrive at the natural park on Little Lake Joseph. Here we have time to stretch and take a little stroll up to Mirror Lake. Is there a finer view in all of Canada? Time to return now. Now for the return trip. Over to Lake Joseph Station to connect with the afternoon train. And now southbound. To Glen Home and the Elgin House. And back to Port Sandfield and Lake Russell. The Big Chief returns to the Indian River.
Here comes the Cherokee, back from Gravenhurst. Lake Muskoka. <laughs> Another call at Bomaris to make the Seguin. It's homeward bound. And back to Muskoka Wharf. A perfect end to a perfect day. Every day they ply. The Cherokee has proceeded south from Russo. To call it Wigwasin and other stops. Then, on to the Indian River. And Port Carling. to Bomaris and Muskoka Wharf to meet the noon train. Returning northward. while Bracebridge passengers board the Islander. To make the Cherokee in Mid Lake. Here she comes now. Farewell, Islander. Returning northwards and back to Port Carling.
continuing upstream and uh-oh here comes the sag <laughs> completing her rounds before returning to Russell for the night. Every ship does her share. Here, the Seguin connects at Bomaris. to the ports of call on western Lake Muskoka. Passing the railway spring bridge at Bala Park and on to Bala. Returning now to the Bala Park Bridge. And back to Bomaris. To meet the flagship. It was much the same at Huntsville and the Lake of Bays. Twice a day, the steamer Iroquois of the Huntsville Navigation Company would leave Dorset for Big Win Inn at other stops. Then proceed to South Portage. To connect with the Little Portage Flyer. which takes us over the divide and back to Peninsula Lake. Now, going through the canal, back to Ferry Lake. And crossing Ferry Lake, and entering the Vernon River. Huntsville.
Meanwhile, the Niska and her scow are busy laying buoys on the Indian River. While a dredge is at work, deepening the channel at Fort Sandfield. And here, an oil tanker delivers fuel to a cottage. Season's end for the Sagamo was usually on Labor Day. Which always called for a nostalgic send-off at Port Carling. Goodbye, Big Chief. Until next year. Gradually, the unrelenting trends of the times began to catch up with the Muskoka Lake steamers. Highways were being paved by the 1930s, and people could now reach the resorts by car. In 1930, the Great Depression dealt a devastating blow to the Muskoka resorts. Getting around the lakes was becoming a little easier. Soon, everyone had a motorboat. Gradually, the lake steamers became redundant as one ship after another was withdrawn from service. In 1931, the Medora was laid up, never to sail again. In 1934, the small steamer Wyoming was lost in a freak storm on northern Lake Muskoka with a loss of three lives. The outbreak of war in 1939 gave the boats a short reprieve when gasoline was rationed and overseas travel became dangerous. After the war, business again began to decline. steamer Amex stopped running in 1949. Soon to be followed by the Islander. And the Cherokee. 
the last of the Huntsville steamers tied up for good in 1952. Making way for a diesel bus boat to connect with the Portage Railway. The little railway, the shortest in the world, itself disappeared after 1959. By the mid-50s, the Sagamo and the Seguin were the only inland excursion steamers still operating in Canada. It was now the Seguin that connected with the Sagamo at Port Carling. But finally, the odds became too great. And when the Sagamo tied up for the last time on Labor Day, 1958, a glorious tradition spanning 92 years came to an end. Where are all the steamers today? All gone. Only a few pathetic relics remain. The day of the steamboat seemed to be over. And yet, the proud era of steam did not die out entirely. A few small steam launches still putter about on the lakes, lovingly restored by their owners. and one passenger ship still survived. The Seguin, which was saved from the scrapyards and turned into a floating marine museum by the town of Gravenhurst in 1962. Later, when it became clear that the old ship badly needed a refit to assure her continued survival, a campaign was launched in 1969 to bring her back to full operating condition. This gave rise to the Muskoka Steamship and Historical Society, which bought the vessel in 1973. Sponsored by the Ontario Road Builders Association as a goodwill project, the Society raised the necessary funds to dry dock and restore the Seguin in July of 1973. It was a long, slow, often frustrating job. One bright spot was the triumphal relaunching of the vessel 
with a new steel hull in 1974. with Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau to do the honors. At least 6,000 people were on hand to witness the event. But the follow-up was an anticlimax. Costs kept going up. and money kept running short. But finally, after a 10-year effort, the last of Canada's inland passenger steamships was able to complete her sea trials and re-enter service in 1981. Lakes of Muskoka are rugged and wide, renowned for their beautiful shores. But their bays and their islands drive steamboat men mad with their rocks and their channels galore. And once a proud fleet sailed these waters so deep, they were captained by hard-bitten men. Now the rest of the fleet are all lost or asleep, but the sea wood is steaming. Again. The Seaguin is steaming again. The Seaguin is steaming again. Come and spread the glad news of the hundred mile cruise for the Seaguin is steaming again. Today, the Seaguin is back where she belongs, taking passengers on sightseeing cruises on the lakes that have known her so well. When they built her, they called her the Nipissing Two. From the shipyards of Glasgow she came. After 40 years service, they built her anew, and they gave her her present proud name. She sailed as the sea went for 33 years, and sat on the dock 24. The Ontario road builders fitted her out, and the sea went is steaming once more. The Seaguin is steaming again. The Seaguin is steaming again. Come and spread the glad news of the hundred mile cruise for the Seaguin is steaming again. She is now the queen of the Muskoka Lakes and one of Ontario's greatest tourist attractions. She's 260 tons with a fresh coat of paint. She's completely when she raced with the flagship, they made her hold back. She's a speedy wee craft without doubt. She's got double screws, she can turn in her tracks, or reverse to the wind without fear. That's good, honest coal smoke that pours from her stack. There's no stinking old diesel fuel here. The Seaguin is steaming again. The Seaguin is steaming again. Come and spread the glad news of the hundred mile cruise for the Seaguin is steaming again. May there never be an end to the day of the steamboat. When the crazy old city has your psyche erect and you can't see the woods for the trees, head up to Muskoka and stick out your neck for a face full of fresh forest breeze. The sunbeams and wavelets, they dance their old dance while the waves on the rocks clap along. You'll go back to the city, a satisfied soul, for 
perhaps even singing the song. The sea wood is steaming again. The sea wood is steaming again. Come and spread the glad news of the hundred mile cruise where the sea wood is steaming.